Okay, good morning. We'll get started. <clears throat> we're still in the uterus. I taught you the regions of the uterus, and to finish up the female anatomy, we'll, we'll do the layers of the uterine wall. Uh, the outermost layer, uh, well, for example, this picture is here to remind me. When I taught the broad ligament, the part of the uh, peritoneum that actually covers the uterus, well, it's actually the outermost layer of the uterine wall. And it's called the parametrium. So it's basically peritoneum covering the uterus. It doesn't cover it completely, okay? Um, another slide to show you what I mean by that. This is kind of like, just well, one slide back. So it's the red line that is this covering that I'm talking about. There's the peritoneum, and it kind of folds in there. When it covers the uterus, that's the covering. So you can see it doesn't cover at all, right? It kind of stops there, and it stops there. So that's what I mean by incomplete covering. The um, bulk of the uterus is muscle. It's the myometrium. Okay, it's the uh, thickest part of the uterine wall. It will um, expand as as the baby develops in there during pregnancy. So this is the muscle layer. That's uh, it's responsive to the oxytocin. And then the light, the innermost lining, endo within, is the endometrium. lining. Um, it's responsive to sex hormones. And in the uh, ovarian cycle, which we'll cover soon, the estrogens and, uh, testo uh, and progesterone. So this is the um, layer that um, it's kind of built up and sloughed off with each ovarian cycle. So it's called uterine cycle, as it thickens and sloughed off, thickens and sloughed off every month. Of course, if you're pregnant, it'll thicken and then not slough off. Let's take a look at the endometrium, myometrium, um, what it looks like. <coughs> and this is what you see here. You see. Um, the myometrium on the bottom, and you should be able to tell endometrium from myometrium. I do ask that. I think um, it's easy to see where the tissues change. Well, not on the illustration, but down here is the myometrium, and you can kind of start to see how the tissue changes when you get up to here. What we learned from this slide is that the endometrium has a functional layer and a basal layer, okay, which they call the stratum functionalis and stratum basalis. So the one that's responsive to the sex hormones and thickens and then gets left off, that, that's the functional layer. Stratum, 
<coughs> functionalis. This is the one that is responsive to sex hormones. And that's the function, right? It's, it's functional. No, not only um, will it thicken, I mean, because it's on top, it is what receives the blastocyst, the fertilized egg for implantation. So I'll say it thickens in preparation for implantation. <coughs> the last thing I'll write about the, the basal layer, oh, excuse me, but the basal layer is, in mensis, it is not sloughed off. It remains. And it, it, it doesn't respond to the sex hormones. So I'll write it up here. Stratum. Basalis. Not responsive to hormones. And um, not sloughed off, not shed. Right, move on. Well, actually, let's not move on quite yet. When you look at this picture, there are two things you should notice that kind of um, change throughout the ovarian cycle. The whole point of thickening isn't just to get thicker. You have to be prepared to nourish the um, implanting blastocyst. So I always have students note that the uterine glands, which secrete glycogen, like right here, and also the spiral arteries, okay, they, they spiral and proliferate <coughs> as you prepare for implantation. So those are a couple of structures to note within stratum functionalis. Uterine glands, Sometimes I call them glycogen glands because they secrete glycogen, food for the uh, baby, and also spiral arteries. Now you can follow the blood supply back to the uterine artery. You don't have to know all these branches, arcuate and then you know the radial artery. Just know the ones that are called the, the coiled spiral arteries, because those are the ones that are actually in the endometrium. Now, talking about that cycle, thickening and getting ready for pregnancy, we have um, slides in different phases of the uterine cycle. Now, this one's called the proliferative phase. So, um, let me clear the board here. So in a 28 day cycle, call it 1 to 28, uh, right in the middle, day 14, that's ovulation. That is the event that has to happen for reproduction. Now the endometrium is just supposed to support um, an ovulated egg that's fertilized and tries to implant. But if you're going to fertilize, that's the day. Okay, if sperm, if sperm is going to be present to fertilize the egg, that, that will be the day. But not talking about that, talking about the thing that will receive it. Um, so let's say you, you weren't pregnant on a given cycle. And you have menses. And uh, menses, menses means month. Well, it's the shedding of the, the lining. That, that's days 28 to 5. 
So it starts on the last day of the previous cycle when you weren't pregnant. It goes all the way to day five. That's menses, day 28 to day 5. Okay, then you rebuild on top of stratum to salus. So they call that the proliferative phase. They call it day 6 to 13. I'll just say proliferative. Um, okay, if you want to title this, this is, you can call it the uterine cycle. I mean, it has to be in sync with the ovarian cycle. But, so you go from, you know, 6 to 13. And the whole point is to rebuild. You thicken. You develop more uterine glands and spiral arteries. Uh, okay, so that's what proliferate means. Right? You just kind of increase in number. And so I think you should be able to recognize endometrium, myometrium, and recognize that this is the proliferative phase um, and not the secretory phase. So the next slide. I thought that was different. Right? Well. Figure out how you're going to ID one from the other. And um, do you see the myometrium? No, you don't. It's not because it's not there. I just couldn't get it in frame because it's so thick. The endometrium is so thick under those same low magnifications, I couldn't get the myometrium in frame. So you, you can see the result of the proliferative phase. This is it's fully proliferated. And so this is called the secretory phase. Sometimes it's called the progravid phase. Gravid means pregnant. So progravid means preceding pregnant. Sometimes it's called the secretory phase because the endometrium becomes a secretory mucosa. Well, this would be day after ovulation, so call it day 15 to 27. Um, ready for implantation in this phase. Because look at it, it's like it's really thick, there's a lot of glands. The glands not only increase in number, they increase in size. They're all like jagged looking because they're so big. Well, their appearance is different. I won't try to describe it. You just look at it and say, oh, okay, yeah, that's secretory phase. So on here, I say for the ovary, the ovaries in the luteal phase, I'll have to find that later. The point you should understand now, this is post ovulation. So if you were going to fertilize, it would be on that day. But where's the typical site of fertilization? It's not here in the uterus. It's in the ampulla of the uterine tube. So it's somewhere else, okay? And um, the point is, if it's gonna implant, what I had said, it, that happens maybe seven to 10 days post-fertilization. So what day would that be in the cycle? Seven to 10 days after this day. Just do the math. What's, Seven plus four, 21, or 20, right in the middle of this part, right? Okay? And so that, that's the whole point of reproduction. So in terms of histology, I might ask you, what's the phase of the uterine cycle? And you should be able to tell. And it's not on like that versus that. It's quite different. Okay, I'm going to move on unless there's any questions about the, the cycle there. Yeah? Uh, remind me on the menses part. Uh-huh. We're sloughing off the, all the glands. Yeah. And the myometrium? Or no, no, that's phase. You slough off just the functional layer of the endometrium. Just the functional. Okay. Yeah, that's what comes off. Okay. 
um, the basal layer stains, and also myometrium, yeah, none of that shed off. Oh, okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, let's move on to the uterine tube, which is associated with the uterus. Uh, okay, let's look at it. Well, there's different parts. Let me see. Uh, I, I like how they point to the different parts, but it doesn't give you... Let's see if I can do this. It's like there's this part here. <laughs> okay, that part that actually has to go through the uterine part, part, that part is called the uterine part of the uterine tube. Okay, so I'm going to erase this chart up here. So, the part I colored in blue, that's the uterine part. Of the uterine tube. The part I colored in blue. It's the part that goes through the uterine wall. So, there's a connection, right? It's continuous. part that's like really thin, so um, I'll, I'll just kind of color it to like here, yeah, more, more or less. Look for the thinnest part, that's what isthmus means, the, the narrowest part of the tube. Okay. And always put of uterine tube. And, and, um, Again, this is just, it's the first part that's the thinnest. Okay, it's the thinnest part after the uterine part. And then, and then it starts to kind of get wider. And I would say uh, all the way up to even here. is um, the part where it gets wide and it's most of the tube. It's pretty much what I colored. And then after that is the infundibulum. Let me write this down first. Ampulla of uterine tube. This is the typical site of fertilization. <laughs> You could fertilize outside the uterine tube. That would be called an ectopic pregnancy if it implants somewhere else. Or it could implant, try to implant in the uterine tube, and that's no good either. That would have to be aborted to save the mother's life. So it's, it's the wide part. So I, I put these descriptors. You know, I want you to remember wide part, thin part. Maybe that'll help you identify it on a test or a quiz. Now, infundibulum is the part that connects. Um, so we get a different color here. It's the part, I'll go all the way up to here. Okay. And, um, it's the part that connects. It's like um, the infundibulum in the pituitary the part that connects to the brain. Okay, 
next to ovary. Although this picture, they kind of draw it off the ovary. Those little finger-like projections at the very end are called um, infundibulum. I'm sorry. Brain fart this month. They're called fimbrae. So let me just draw these little finger-like projections. Those are fimbrae. And they, well, just the fingers. That's what fimbrae means, fingers. Well, that's, that's kind of what they are. So they kind of move a little bit, and they create a little bit of a current that helps suck an ovulated oocyte um, into the infundibulum, into the ampulla, where hopefully it'll just kind of wait. And all along, the oviduct is lined with the cilia that kind of help beat and kind of help keep the um, ovulated oocyte in the uterus, in the uterine tube, for about a day. It's just a single cell all by itself somewhere in the uterine tube, and hopefully it'll become fertilized. Now, let's look at a cross-section of the uterine tube. And let's look at other models of the uterine tube so you can kind of see the different parts. Maybe you looked at this model. What if I put a piece of tape here and said identify? I would say the uterine part, the uterine tube. What if I put this part here? Isthmus. If I put anywhere after here, all of that is ampulla. Now, when, I, when you get to this part, this is infundibulum. If I put it right on the notched <coughs> edge, oh, those are the fimbrae. All right, so um, those are the regions of the uterine tube. Here is the cross-sectional view of the uterine tube. It's not a round hole. Um, there's all these little nooks and crannies for the egg to reside in. If you take a high mag picture of the epithelium, most books will say that it's a simple columnar ET. But um, in most of the slides I looked at from our collection, it's more, I have to trust my eyes, not when I read in books. That looks like it's stratified to me. Always look at the nuclei. Okay, maybe you're never taught what's stratified, what's super stratified, what's simple. I, I let the nuclei be the clue. If I see a single row of cigar shaped nuclei, that's simple columnar. But if it looks like they're stacked on top of one another, it has the appearance of stratification, I go with pseudo stratified. So that's what I'm going to go with here, even though I called it that. <coughs> So the oviduct, or the uterine tube, became ciliated. I changed it. Um, so yeah, you'll see both. And then that's a remarkable confusion to students. You want everything to be the same. And I'm not going to keep things the same for you. In, in some histology slides, it may be simple columnar. You have to be able to identify simple columnar. You have to be able to identify pseudo stratified. And I know students just want me to tell you, well, what is it? So you can memorize it. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to show you a slide. You have to correctly identify the tissue. Is it pseudostratified? Well, on the quiz, I show you simple columnar. I could do that. Look at what I'm showing you, and you'll be OK. Um, I think the cilia is very important. It's going to beat the 
egg around until the sperm get there. I want to move away from the uterine tube and talk about some supportive ligaments here. This is the uh, overhead view. This picture I've noticed uh, they cut from the um, atlas. It's not there anymore in the third edition, but this one still is. That's why I want a page number for that. And so let's, there's three ligaments uh, I want you to identify here that support the uterus. There's uterosacral ligament. Uterosacral ligament located within uterosacral folds. So they're providing this posterior support for the uterus. Um, so these uterosacral folds, the fold is this peritoneum that kind of covers them. So on the picture on the left, let me point to it. You'll see this on the model too. See that fold there and that fold there? There's a ligament inside there. So if we dissect away the peritoneum, you can see the uterosacral ligament there. And there it goes to the sacrum, okay? uterosacral ligaments. This one going from side to side in the transverse plane, those are transverse or cardinal ligaments. Cardinal is an alternate name. So these are providing a, a lateral support for the uterus. And then there's um, a ligament that attaches to the uterus, and it goes forward into the female inguinal canal, and that's the round ligament. going to attach somewhere in the labia. Now, this is like the spermatic cord in males. Okay. In females, it's just a ligament. For the transverse ligaments, um, does that lateral support just kind of fit down the walls? Oh. What does it attach to? Um, just the sides of the pelvis. Here's another picture of it, too. Maybe that'll help you. So, kind of just lateral, I'm not sure what muscle that is. Um, one thing of note, there's something called a uterine prolapse, or if structures in the pelvis weaken, the uterus falls down into the vaginal canal. Uh, it can happen during uh, labor and delivery, but that's one of the ligaments that would weaken that lateral support. So can we, that's really, yeah, I have to look at which muscle that is. Okay, the other thing I want to mention that I skipped, well, I did mention it, but I want to show you a picture of it, is how the round ligament is like the spermatic cord in males. So I put these side by side so we can kind of compare them. So the structure I labeled is the superficial and wheel ring, and you can kind of see both structures emerging from there. All right, so those are the other ligaments I wanted to show you. I did skip over this slide too, sorry. But I wanted to take a picture of the model in the room. Perhaps you've looked at it. And um, some of those ligaments are shown here. The only one that's not shown on model is the transverse cardinal ligament. So I have to use a picture for that. But these other two are shown. For example, well, what's that going to be? Well, I have a label here, round ligament. But you can see they have the fold there, and the ligament will be inside it. All right, the last thing I need to discuss is the vaginal canal. It's a three to four inch fibromuscular tube.
right, it receives penis during intercourse. And with the um, cervical canal, it forms the natural birth canal. Notice how there's an angle between the vaginal canal and, um, and the uterus, kind of bends forward over the uh, urinary bladder. So natural birth is baby goes down head first. If um, not enough dilation occurs at the cervix, the doctor will decide, may decide to do a C-section where they go in through the abdominal wall. It's major surgery. They would have to cut through. They usually make an incision along the bikini line, but you have to go through all, all these layers of muscle uh, to get to the uterus to deliver it through the uterine wall. If you don't do it through that. Okay, well, anyways, it's. Uh, yes. I should have mentioned the fornix. There's the vaginal fornix. I didn't mention that for that sliver there. That's where it is? Yeah, that's where the, um, in the previous lecture I said it's one of the receives. It receives the ejac ejaculate. Yeah, I'm going to put that down. Okay. Vaginal fornix. Receives ejaculate. Thanks for reminding me of that. That's important. Think of the fornix as the junction between vagina cervix. Sometimes books talk about coat hanger abortions, where they try to go in to uh, scrape off, but they go through there and they go up into the peritoneal cavity instead, through the vaginal fornix instead of the cervical canal. Uh, let's see here. The last slide I have, this isn't in the same region, but because we're talking about reproduction, the breast or mammary gland is very important to mention for a nursing mother. It's attached to the pectoral muscles by a connective tissue called these suspensory ligaments. Attached to pec muscles. The uh, suspensory ligaments. Now, the uh, milk producing structures, we'll just call them mammary lobes. Okay, They're, they respond to the um, prolactin. PDRL, remember that? And then also the lactiferous ducts.
That's the typical sign of a breast cancer tumor. Um, well, anyways, they have smooth muscle that will dilate and let them melt down. That, that's um, a response to oxytocin. Respond to oxytocin. Remember, prolactin is milk production, and oxytocin is milk letdown. Well, you're already supposed to know that, but uh, I think that's all I'll put. I usually have areola and nipple um, for the suckling baby, but I've noticed I've never put that on a test, so I, I'll stop putting it on the board, but I at least did mention to areola and nipple. Uh, areola and nipple. And also, the, usually we used to teach lactiferous sinus. Um, I'm reading more now that that's an artifact of preserving the cadavers, and it's not really something that's there in a, in a living human. So I, I stopped teaching that as well. Um, you can't really see the areola. It's the brownish tissue that surrounds the nipple. And it's usually bumpy in appearance due to sebaceous glands. Uh, in terms of reproduction, I, I just want to focus on the lactiferous um, ducks and the mammary lobes for the milk production and milk letdown. I put one slide that I uh, got from the internet site that's labels on, labels off to help you study the structures. Um, but that was uh, the end of the female repro anatomy. And I wanted to start the meiosis since I still have some time. And so I'm done with uh, female and male. That was just the anatomy. So to introduce physiology, I just want to talk about meiosis. Because in reproduction, the whole point of sexual reproduction between the two biological sexes, male and female, is that you have two cells that come together. Sperm and egg. Each of those cells, sperm and egg or oocyte, they have half the DNA. And when they fertilize, you restore the full complement of the human genome. And so meiosis is the process of cell division where each sperm, each egg will have half of what you need so that it can be restored in fertilization. And it's the only cell line that accomplishes this type of cell division. All of the cells that do cell division is just regular mitosis, which is taught in 430. And so I want to do that as a precursor to the ovarian cycle. And so to talk about the human genome, we do a, you can do a karyotype analysis. Let's say, for example, you're pregnant, but I don't know, you do some blood tests, and your doctor is concerned, maybe there's some high-risk categories, maybe mom and dad have concerns. So you may recommend an amniocentesis, which is where you withdraw fluid from the amniotic cavity And then those fluids should contain a lot of fetal cells. You just put them in culture. They're highly mitotic. And what you do is, um, after cell culture, and just kind of put them under the microscope, you just kind of analyze them by looking at, well, like pictures like this. Okay. I mean, they're all jumbled up. But you can kind of like arrange them. Uh, so the human genome is 23 chromosomes. It's all been mapped out. The mapping of the human genome. They, they did that when I was in grad school. Uh, they're doing a lot more with it now. But just to know what it is. I mean, there's even sites like 23andMe. So how many sets of chromosomes are there? 23? Yeah. The human genome is 23 pairs. Of homologous chromosomes. Now what I've learned over the years of teaching this lecture is part of the confusion are all the terms. But that's not hard. Just remember what the term means, and then you'll be OK. Like, for example, why do we say human genome? What the heck is a gene? 
Well, I mean, that term was coined by, you know, Gregor Mendel before they knew about DNA, hundreds of years ago. You know, in high school, you do the Punit squares, and your biology teacher tells you about the pea pod plants, right? He, he thought that, well, you could pass traits on, parental strains of plants, pass traits on to other plants, their offspring, um, and he thought, we coined the term gene, that these traits are passed on from parental strains to um, their offspring. But he didn't know what molecules carry the gene. And so which molecules carry the genes? D and A, right? So we know um, DNA carries the genes. How do we see DNA in a cell, in the nucleus? We see the chromosomes. Right, you learn about chromosome structure in 430. You know, they're all wrapped up in the histone proteins. Okay? So why, why the heck are they called chromosomes? They're DNA. Well, aren't these colorful? Say yes. <laughs> they're, they're chromatic. So they're called chromosomes. Okay. Um, a bunch of different ways of saying it's the DNA. Now, in terms of um, the bio, okay, let me get to this slide then. So you do a karyotype analysis to see if the chromosomes are normal. You were worried about some kind of genetic abnormality. But let's say all is good. Great. Um, one thing you could do is um, understand that most of these chromosomes are called autosomes. The one pair that determines sex are the sex chromosomes. So let's go over this here. So when I say pairs, do you see why I say 23 pairs? They're, they're definitely pairs. Now, you inherited your genes from your mom and your dad, biological mom, biological dad. You got one set from mom, one set from dad okay, of the pair. Um, so what's homology to you? Well, I don't, let, let's draw one pair. Here's one pair. How about I use colors? Since mom and dad will be illustrated by colors, maybe. Uh, green and purple. Dad. Mom. It's one of the 23, maybe number one. To use an example. Homologous means, well, um, there's something called locus. All the genes are located in different parts of this chromosome number one. Um, just to pick some arbitrary spot, let's say, for example, at this locus right there, right there. Let's say that that's the locus for hair color. Black hair red hair. Your mom has a gene, your mom has red hair, so that trait was expressed by this gene right here. And your dad has black hair, as an example. Well, that gene's in the same location on the same chromosome because we're in the same species. We both have, they're homologous to each other. They're, they're both the gene that expresses hair color. A different hair color, so what are you going to look like? Well, I don't know. But the point is, that's what homologous means, and that's why they're paired. Your inheritance is only from your mom and your dad, and nobody else. Okay. All right, so this having been said, um, in terms of biological sex determined by one pair of sex chromosomes, Y male, XX female. What sex is this person on the slide? Male. male. So for those of you who didn't quite spot it, sex chromosomes are right there. Now the Y chromosome, um, if you take a genetics class, you'll learn that there's a part of the Y chromosome, uh, it's called the SRY element. 
you, you don't have to know that, but there, there's a, some protein from the Y chromosome that determines the male pathway. So if you just want to talk about biological sex, are you going to have a boy? Or are you going to have a girl? It's 50-50. Okay. If you inherit an X chromosome from dad, it's female. If you inherit a Y chromosome from dad, it's male. Okay. So let's remember. Whoops. Let's remember that it's 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. So technically that's 46. But the goal of meiosis is you want each of the germline cells of the sperm and egg to have half of that. So instead of 23 pairs, you just want 23 single chromosomes. Okay? So that, for example, you restore the 23 pairs or 46 through fertilization. So distinguish 23 pairs from 23 single chromosomes in cell division. Because when you learn cell division in biology 430, we teach regular mitosis whether, where there is not a reduction of the genetic material, okay? Just the two daughter cells have the same genetic makeup as the parental cell that they came from. But not here, not in reproduction. You want to reduce to half. And um, it's one of the more confusing things that we go over, actually, uh, where in regular good old mitosis, that's what you start off with in mother cell. In the two daughter cells, that's kind of what you end up with, right? The same number of chromosomes here. I see two purple, two green. I see two purple, two green. Two purple, two green, okay? But not here. I see one cell here. <coughs> How many do I see here? Two. One cell becomes two in regular cell division. Here's meiosis, what we're talking about. I see one cell becomes one, two, three, four. That's one difference. I see there's there's four things in there, four chromosomes. I see two, 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 two. So so it looks like you know there's some differences between meiosis and mitosis. And so this is what we're talking about today. And I have some terms here. I think it's better if I just kind of go through the whole process and you'll pick up the terms as we go. But let me define a few before I proceed. So I'm going to back it up one slide to look at this figure. Because what we teach you in 430, you may have forgotten by now. Um, I think you probably had a lot of things. 4.30, it's hard to remember all that stuff unless you use it every day. You know, I've taught this class 40 times. I still have to look at my lecture slides before I come to class. Um, so one thing we teach you in 4.30 are the regular things that happen in interphase. The regular life of a cell. Okay, most of it is spent in, in the interphase. And some cells divide. Not all cells. Like for example, muscle fibers, they don't do mitosis. And neither do neurons. That's why, like for example, if you get a head injury and you damage um, some of those cells, sometimes you don't get their function back. So some cells don't do mitosis. But for example, epithelial cells, connective tissue cells, they, they kind of do a lot of cell division very well. And today we're going to talk about like sperm and egg cells. They do cell division very well, but not mitosis, meiosis. But let's talk about these other things um, in interphase. Let's say you are a cell that wants to divide. One thing you have to do is you have to replicate the DNA. That's done in the S phase. So think about this. Okay, I'm a cell. I'm going to divide. I have to double all my DNA. DNA replicates. Okay, G2. The other final preparations for division. Um, 
look for the centrosomes to duplicate. I'll say replicate. Usually a centrosome, um, okay, I'm going to draw that little cylinder as a centriole. Centrioles are, are made out of microtubules. Um, okay, there's usually two of them at an angle, and there's usually like these little rays. They look like rays of sunshine coming out. Those are actually microtubules. But sometimes books call them astral rays. Well, anyways, this whole thing is a centrosome, this whole thing. Okay, so when they duplicate, when you get two of them, the cell is getting ready to divide. So I'll just draw another one. Draw another center cell, astral rays. So that's another term I would get out of where the whole center cell thing. When you see two of them in a the cell, you know the cell is in very late interphase, and the cell is going to get ready to divide. Oh, the other thing I had on the board, I guess I should redraw it, my homologous pair of a chromosome. Got the inheritance from mom and from dad. Let's kind of relate this to what I said, DNA replicates. Okay, so what does that look like? Um, okay, let's say this green one replicates. So what I did was, I, I just drew two of them out. They're copies of each other, okay? It, it's, replication is like Xerox copy, it's, it's the same, all right? And they're attached at the um, center there. The center where they're attached is the central mirror. And there's this outer part. There's a part of that central mirror where the astral rays can kind of like attach to it and move chromosomes around. So that little purple part I drew, that's called the kinetic core. replicated, they're just copies of each other. The term that's used is uh, sister chromatin. <coughs> so there's two chromosomes, they're attached on the central mirror, and they're just sister chromatids, they're copies. Okay. So you could do the same thing for the, for the purple. replicated. And um, there's a part of the cell division where it's like, now these are still homologous chromosomes to each other. They're, they're homologous um, as I drew them before and even though that now they're doubled, they're, they're going to kind of find each other. Like this one's going to like get close to this one because it, it's the homolog and one from mom, one from dad. Um, and when they find each other and they, and they become close and they make contact, that's called synapsis. When they kind of buddy up in close proximity. So, when they're all together, they call this whole thing Tetrad. Tetrad formation. What number does tetra usually refer to? Four. Because there's four chromosomes, right? One, two, three, four. That's a tetrad. 
Well, it turns out the two purples are sister chromatids to each other, and the two greens are sister chromatids to each other. But the purple to the green, those are homologous chromosomes. Let me write that down. We've got sister chromatids, but we also have this term, that to that. Homologous chromosomes. The purple is homologous to green, right? The and but the two purples and the two greens are just copies. So when I said, you know, there's a lot of terms, that's kind of what I meant. If you keep the, keep the terms straight, I, I think it'd be okay. So getting back to this, do you see on the right side where it says meiosis? Do you see where it says the tetrad formation? Okay, that, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Um, Our goal is to talk about meiosis first, and then what I want to do is talk about it and apply it to the female ovary. So um, the meiotic events are shown here, and then the ovarian events are shown here with meiosis occurring alongside of it because they occur hand in hand. But before I can teach this figure, I just need to go through the basic um, parts of meiosis. Okay. You know, I think this is an okay place to stop for today. I just kind of gave some terms. and uh, What I want to do now is take a break, and when you come back from break, you're going to have your quiz. Phase first.